my dad calls me. He's like, hey, um, we got an offer for our building in Kansas. Do you want to do a 1031 exchange? I didn't know what that was at the time. And um, once he explained it to me, I was like, uh, hell yeah. <laughs> Move over, baby boomers. It's time for Gen XYZ. It's time to stop waiting on the world to change. It's time to be the change. It's time to stop thinking about how your life can be better. It's time to start taking action, massive action to improve your life. Join Zach Winner and Mark Adair Rios every week as we learn how others have the grit, determination, and conviction to 10X their lives. And as we explore ways that can help you 10X your life. Hi, and welcome to another edition of the 10X for Gen XYZ podcast. I'm Zach Winner. And I'm Mark Adair Rios. And today our guest is Will Tiao. Will is a real estate developer, a broker, and a property manager. He's the director of the commercial real estate division at the Collective Realty and the owner and broker of Tiao Properties, a property management and real estate investment company. Tiao Properties currently manages over 400 units throughout greater LA. Since opening its business in 2012, Will has sold hundreds of units worth over $135 million in sales. Will also has a very impressive background, and we'll get into this a little bit more, but just the highlights. He graduated from Tufts University, magna cum laude, with a BA in international relations, received a master's in international relations from Columbia University, and received a Fulbright scholarship from DeSalle University at Manila in the Philippines. He worked as an international economist in the Clinton and George W. Bush administrations, and after that, and before entering the real estate industry, he was also in the entertainment industry. So with that, Will, welcome to the show. <laughs> Thank you guys for having me. Yeah, yeah great, great, great to have you. Yeah, totally. So, you know, maybe we should start with your origin story and tell us a little yeah. bit about, about what led you to, to your career in real estate and how you got started in it. Yeah, it's been a long roundabout road. <laughs> so... Um, so, uh, my, my family, my parents are originally from Taiwan and they came to, um, my dad was a graduate student at Kansas state university, uh, which is in Manhattan, Kansas, uh, in the late 1960s. That's where my sister and I were born. And, um, you know, in some ways the real estate journey started there. My, um, my, dad started seeing small apartment buildings near campus and thought student housing. <laughs> so he started, you know, he started at first, I think the family bought a small building and then he started managing that and then started managing for others. So I kind of grew up in the business mm -hmm. of, uh, you know, I grew up with like 3 a.m. calls, like toilets were exploding or whatever, <laughs> fires are happening, all that type of stuff. So I kind of have literally seen it all since I was a kid. Um, now, was he buying um, apartments that weren't necessarily student housing and converting them or they were No, no, it just, I mean, we lived in a college town. Mm -hmm. uh, so there were two major um, kind of tenant bases. One was there was a university, Kansas State University. The other was that uh, was Fort Riley military base. That's one of the largest army bases in the country. Yeah. So between those two and then just like the regular town's population, which is about 50K, like there was enough of a tenant base, like there's, there, there was just, you know, so, but, you know, most of the buildings that were at least near campus were student housing. And then as you got closer to the military base, it was more military. Exactly. It just depended yeah. on, on where the location was. My dad was, a um, uh, had a degree in agriculture economics. He was, um, and he, um, previously had had a master's in computer science. So was the first to kind of integrate those. Mm -hmm. And um, so um, he was had it was a good brain for numbers. He could, he could always remember when people owed him money. <laughs> so Didn't always remember their names, but I was like, what apartment are you? Oh, number 42. Oh yeah, you owe me 500. <laughs> <laughs> That's awesome. He always had, he always had that brain. That's really what it comes down to, right? I mean, let's, to, let's be real. He told me, he told me recently something very funny. He's like, yeah, I don't, I don't, you know, I don't necessarily believe in heaven and hell, but I think I'll probably go to hell because there's a lot of people down there that owe me money. <laughs> <laughs> it's going down to collect. I'm, gonna go He's down like, I'm going to collect. <laughs> I might not be able to get out. 
but uh, <laughs> that's funny. So anyways, but that I kind of grew up in that environment. But, you know, my parents, actually, the reason they left was because they were political dissidents. Mm. Um, Taiwan was um, a dictatorship at that point and under martial law. Wow. And uh, and so um, so I kind of grew up in this kind of very politicized environment. And because of that, that's kind of why I started, you know, my studies in international relations, because I was like really interested in being a diplomat. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, so I started actually started at University of Michigan my first year. I started off as a cello performance major mm -hmm. and then and then transferred to, to Tufts. Um, and then uh, Tufts is no, very well known for its international relations program. The Fletcher School of Law and Diplomacy is there that that they run with Harvard. Uh, and um, I took classes there, you know, studied and um, did my junior year in France um, and studied, you know, political science at uh, Sciences Po there. Um, yeah, so like my background was primarily like in, in a sense, my, all my training was in policy and in politics. Mm. And I started working in DC when I was 19, like, you know, just interning on the Hill, like mm -hmm. nonprofits, then for my Senator, eventually got a presidential management fellowship under the Clinton administration. And then- So do you, do you, do you just show up and, and, I mean, obviously you're on a track, but do you just kind of pack your bags? Like, and we'll talk about this later, but like you do go to Hollywood, you pack your bags, I'm going to DC. And then, you know, grab an internship or how does that I mean, no, I mean, it was it was obviously like it, it's a step by step process. Right. I remember. So I remember I went to Michigan that first year and then I was transferring to Taos. I got an internship with a, a Taiwanese nonprofit in um, in D.C. Um, and when I was there, I I knocked like I literally went door to doors through the halls of Congress, like meeting with over 300 congressmen, senators offices because you knew the hill. You knew yeah. you wanted to to get That's what I wanted politics. to do at that time. At that time, I really wanted to do politics. Yeah. Right. And once I learned how the Hill worked, mm -hmm. then my senator, I was from Kansas, so Nancy Kassebaum was my senator. Bob Dole was my other senator. And um, I really wanted to work for Kassebaum. I remember she only took juniors and I was a sophomore. But because, you know, once again, I just kind of learned the system. I learned that like, if you got yourself in front of them and they can make a good case. So, and I had enough credits to be a junior. So I actually flew down. I remember flying from Boston from where Tufts was down to DC for the day. And I met with the intern coordinator who was just like recent college grad herself, yeah. you know, and I convinced her to like take me on. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, just like, just like stuff like that. Like I was, you know, and, and, like I said, just cause I had already at that point had already done the face to face, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, that next year I was in Paris and um, you know, I was living with a French host family and one day a guest comes over, gets really interested in talking to me. The school I was going to in Paris, Sciences Po is like, I mean, the way the French system is set up, it's like, it's as if every Ivy League school specialized in an area like Yale was only law and MIT was only engineering. So mm -hmm. I was going to the school Sciences Po where every French pre president, prime minister, you know, everybody yeah. had ever gone, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. So I'm at this very prestigious school and, you know, I'm Asian American. I'm kind of, mm -hmm. you know, learning, uh, doing everything in French. And, um, and I was like, I was, uh, I met someone there who ended up having a French multinational company send me to the Philippines um, for an internship. And when I was in the, when I was there, I networked, uh, I made um, uh, friends with a professor at, uh, de La Salle University in Manila. And then eventually when I applied for my Fulbright scholarship, they sponsored my Fulbright. So, um, so it's just like, you know, it's just one step at a time, like, you know, just constantly like always uh, kind of just making those connections, you know, and always asking questions and always like, you know, like the one thing I, I like about being here in Los Angeles is like, it's a place that encourages people to take risks Mm -hmm. And are, are your willingness to go for certain things like back on the East Coast, I found that like, you know, it's more old school, more European in, in a way. It's like if you step out of your lane, people kind of like frown upon it. You're not, mm -hmm. you're not, it's not seen as like, you know, someone who's, you know, um, yeah, you're just stepping out of your lane, like go back to your lane, you know, whereas definitely out here on the West coast, there's just more of a frontier mentality. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I, I like that, you know, um, whether it's in, in, in entertainment industry or in real estate, like 
people are like very open to to out of the box ideas. Yeah. Um, and so so and that's what I've always enjoyed. So did you do you feel what's something that just really kind of occurred in my mind? And maybe this is totally wrong, but did you feel you were always like, did it feel like you were kind of not jumping from institution to institution, but everything was connected at the institutional level? like universities, nonprofits, and then you're in DC and it's, you know. Yeah, that whole world, yes, it, it was very interconnected. You know, right. like, I mean, they're, Tufts and Columbia and these kind of like Ivy League, pre, like kind of type schools, they're feeders right. to, you know, these types of like government institutions, you know. A lot of my 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 classmates still work for those institutions, you mm-hmm. know, they they're, they're, they're now very high up in some of those areas, you know, and, um, you know, yeah. So, so those, like, if you, any of you talk to all those people, there is kind of like, they all come from similar schools and, you know, have similar trainings and, you know, they went to the Kennedy school at Harvard or they went to the Mm -hmm. uh, Woodrow Wilson school at Princeton or, you know, or where I went, the school of international public affairs at Columbia, you know, there's a lot of those types and they, they make up a, a large, portion of the people in nonprofits and in government institutions and even in, in the private sector, you know, who are doing internet multi, uh, multinational affairs, you know, um, I just realized, you know, by the time I got out, I was working, I started to got this presidential management fellowship working in the Clinton administration mm-hmm. and later in the Bush administration, I just realized pretty quickly that I was not a good bureaucrat. <laughs> so your I'm title not, was um, international economist. For international the economist. Yeah. I used so what, to, what, were you, what kinds of things were you doing? So I was um, my first job was to review. So um, two of the multilateral multilateral lending institutions are the World Bank and the IMF, the International Mon- right, Monetary right. Fund. Both those, um, you know, obviously countries give money to those institutions which they then lend out right right, often to developing countries or whatnot and um the united states has certain um criteria for any look like because they're the biggest lender to these institutions so the united states has certain criteria my job was to review those loans to make sure that they fit certain criteria particularly on the labor front which is where I what I was working on. So I would work with the IMF, I'd work with the World Bank, and I'd work with oftentimes our embassies in different countries, just <laughs> making sure that those those uh, loans and the projects that they were funding were adhering to these kind of uh, core labor standards that the you know that the United States Congress had set. Sorry, and Guam, you're tra- traveling <laughs> during that time to all these. Uh... No, it was all policy related. So I was doing a lot of this. It was it was all, and that that was part of what bummed me out because I was like looking forward to traveling, <laughs> but it turned out to be very much a desk job, yeah. you know, and I wasn't too happy about that. Um, and then uh, you, I would be like, oh man, I gotta I gotta go do a site visit. I gotta yeah, go to right? Fiji. <laughs> I know, right? That's what I was hoping. You know, I gotta, but I gotta get out there, the, man. Also, also the timing was kind of off. So I was there on 9-11. Mm-hmm. So, you know, we were evacuated. <laughs> you know, I mean, that last plane they say was headed to the Capitol. Yeah, like yeah, we scary. were totally evacuated, right? And like I remember I was part of the World Trade Organization, the WTO negotiations. We were, you know. I was supposed to go to Doha originally. I was on, on the team that was negotiating. But then, like, then they started cutting down who would go because of the security mm. concerns, mm-hmm. right? I mean, and then I remember attending, like, a secret briefing, and and they're just like, yeah, so this terrorist has said they're going to bomb it, and this ter- <laughs> 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 like, <laughs> So that's when you thought, maybe I should shift my career choice. I'm going to become an actor. <laughs> <laughs> so... I, the acting thing was like a complete, like, obviously like left field turn, right? Like I, I was kind of getting frustrated with the bureaucracy and I don't know, I think a friend of mine was visiting and said, um, if you could do anything like no, no barriers, what would you do? And I I think I said, I would be an actor or whatever. So she kept on pushing me to take an acting class. I'm like, fine, whatever. So I take an acting class just for fun. Did you, did you do any acting in college or? No, no, school? not at all. Not since high school. Like, you know, I did a little bit in high school, but like nothing. My friends were at the thespians. I was not like, yeah. you know, I was <laughs> not at all. And so um, I did, I did a class that led to a play and then an agent saw me 
and was like, hey, you look great on camera. I'd love to like, you know, and then they just started booking me. And I just started like getting like commercials. And then I got a TV shows and I got a movie. And then I was like doing all this. at this point or still? In no, DC? I'm in DC. I'm, I'm in DC. I still have my full-time job as oh an economist. I wonder if there's any actors listening like this son of a bitch. <laughs> He's just getting all these movies. He's not even in town. I'm not yeah, even sure. trying. I'm literally not even trying. Like, but oh I think, you know, like there was a dearth of Asian American actors out there that could do, do the work. And, um, but to be honest with you, like the job that I had, those were the, the jobs most people want. Cause it's almost like having tenure, right? Once you're yeah. in the federal government, in that fast track, like mm. towards management, people never leave. Oh, I bet you in know? the Asian community too. Like, oh know, yeah, you probably were on the down low, right? You're like, you couldn't tell your parents. You, you're people like, were oh. like, this is like crazy. <laughs> you know, I started going up to New York because I was getting so much work. I was like flying up to New York on the weekends, wow. meeting with casting directors and agents. And it just like kind of like turned. And then, um, and then when Bush won, Bush didn't have George W. Bush the second, um, he did not have what was called trade promotion authority, used to call fast track, which is basically like Congress has to give the president this authority to negotiate trade agreements. Otherwise, they'll go back and renegotiate and no country is going to negotiate with you if they know that Congress is going to go back and renegotiate it. Right. So all my negotiations came to a halt, like everything I was working on just stopped. And I, you know, I'm three years in, I'm like, you know, acting all the time. And I'm like, I'm, I'm you know, what was I? I was like 20, late, my late 20s. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I wasn't married. I, I, I was in a relationship, but it wasn't that serious. And I was like, well, if I'm going to do this. Probably should be now. <laughs> I don't have kids. <laughs> I, don't have... Oh, it's like, I mean, it's just like, you know, I just did the calculation. I'm like, if I'm going to take a risk, this is the moment. Wow. Yeah. So I asked for a leave of absence and they gave it to me because I didn't have any work to do. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I, I read a New Yorker article about this woman named Susan Batson, who was um, Nicole Kidman's acting coach. She also worked with, she had worked with Tom Cruise and Nicole Kidman on Eyes Wide Shut and then continued to work with Nicole on uh, the others and the hours, which she won the Oscar for. That's actually what, she, that was what she was working with on when I met Susan. Nice. Mm. And um, Susan, you know, I mean, couldn't pick two more different people. Like she's short African-American lady, like grew up in like the Broadway kind of acting world and uh, has studied with all the masters. And uh, she took one look at me and she's like, oh boy, we got a lot of work to do. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Uh, so, but, but, you know, she kind of, she was very, you know, she took me under her wing and I, mm -hmm. I, I basically, cause I hadn't gone to like drama school or any of these things, this, like I, I was there every day, you know, for months, you know, and just kind of like, you know, just studied under her. And then, and then she opened up a studio out here. I had a showcase at the same time. I also realized very quickly, like there wasn't a lot of work for me in New York. Like it's mostly it's mostly obviously theater. Uh, there's not a lot of TV at that time. There wasn't a lot of TV or, right. or movies shooting there. And the TV shows that were there weren't that like- Sopranos. Of, yeah, exactly. It's like I, Law and Order and Sopranos. If, okay. Law and Order and Sopranos and, and maybe a, a few daytime soaps, you know, none of which I'm going to be on, you know? Um, whereas like the stuff that I was getting, they were like, oh yeah, that all shoots in LA. And I'm like, well, what am I doing here? <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I came out here 20 years ago, almost to the day. It's mm -hmm. July 28th. It's 20 years ago today, guys. Wow. I moved to yeah. LA. This is, is great no, that we're no joke, guys. This. No joke. Fantastic. 20 years ago today, I came to Los Angeles. Love Happy that. anniversary. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> <laughs> I just realized that. That's interesting. So yeah, so I came out and... Um, I did the showcase. I got an agent right away and I just continued studying under Susan. Uh, and then my old boss calls me and says, Hey, they got fast track going. We got our negotiations happening. Do you want to come back? <laughs> You're like, no way, man. <laughs> I, I had to think about kid. I thought about it. I really did. I was like, I honestly was like, well, 
I, like I said, I knew it was a job that a lot of people really wanted, you know, right. and, and I knew it was a big thing to give up, but I just, yeah, there, obviously there was something in me. I was actually on a trip. I actually went to Taiwan for uh, like a, a week or two and it was there that I got the email. And I just remember thinking, yeah, I think, you know, I don't, I don't, I just don't want to be in a cubicle the rest of my life. <laughs> <I> just, <laughs> you know, right, I'm just right. not, that's not who I am. You know, now were you, would, would have you, would you have made more if you went back versus what you were making at that point? In I was making community? nothing. I was an actor. <laughs> so of course, of course I would have made more, but, but I had made a smart investment. I bought a condo in DC hmm. and it was appreciating rapidly. Thank God. Nice. And, um, uh, and so once I made the decision, right, then I sold the condo. I'd almost, I had almost doubled my money. I made like a 70 or 75% return on that condo. And then, um, and I had invested in a building with my parents in mm. Kansas at the time. And my dad calls me after I make the decision, I'm going to stay. I remember starting to look for apartments and my dad calls me. He's like, Hey, um, we got an offer for our building in Kansas, do you want to do a 1031 exchange? I didn't know what that was at the time. Mm -hmm. And um, once he explained it to me, I was like, uh, hell yeah. Was this, <laughs> right? was this, was this a, another multi or was this an, a commercial? This was a multifamily yeah. that I own 50% with my parents. Right. So, so just to give you some background. So that was a building. It was right next to the campus of Kansas State University, 12 units. We had actually built it. It was a ground up construction build. Oh, okay. so it was newer. So it was a brand new building, right? Beautiful. So, um, so I started with those 12 units. I start looking. Um, I remember I was, I was a terrible client. I had two agents. I had one from Echo Park to West Hollywood and another from Beverly Hills to Santa Monica. Um, I thought I wanted to be a West Sider. I was primarily looking on the West Side at first. But the first property I saw was a fourplex in Los Feliz. Hmm. And um, it was exactly at the price that we were selling the other building for. Um, and um, it was basically like, um, they were all townhomes. It was like four townhomes stuck together, two bedroom, two and a half bath, you know. Just so two, I can get a sense, sorry to, sorry to interrupt, but just so I, I can know. get a sense. So the timing here was, you said 20 years. So this is pre-crash. This is probably 2000, 2005 or something. Three, 2003. 2003. Okay. Like literally. Yeah. Okay. 2003. Cool. So yeah. Pre-crash. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So um, basically that was the first building I saw, but it was like, like I didn't know the market yet. And then it went under contract and I thought, okay, well, it is what it is. So I looked at, I looked at over 200 buildings hmm. and I really got to know the city, you know, and um, I put in, you know, and this was like, these are crazy times. Like once again, multiple offer, you know, there was like, it was that time, yeah, you know, it was where, ramping up yeah, again. It was yeah. ramping up and it was, it was getting nuts. And so we were constantly be, I must put in like eight or 10 offers, you know, oh. got beat out. Yeah. I finally got into escrow on a sixplex in West LA near UCLA. Once again, student housing was all UCLA students. And um, I remember going through doing the inspection and being like, this feels really almost like I'd be going back. Like, you know, to Kansas type of thing. And then I got a call that that fourplex, I, the first one I saw was back, had fallen out of escrow. Nice. And I just, I would just, I just had kind of fallen in love with that property when it first came. And I was like, yeah, I think that that's the one, you know? Mm -hmm. And so I canceled that six plus escrow. I went to um, escrow on the fourplex and I closed. And that was my first, um, my first deal here mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. Um, I always like to, <coughs> I always like to talk about like, look, okay, so I started with 12 units, right? Then I, I traded those 12 units in Kansas for four units in California. Mm -hmm. You guys know what happened after 2003. Yeah. I mean, the market just went yeah. crazy, right? Yeah. Yeah. So two years later, two years, someone makes us an offer we can't refuse, okay? So we decide to sell the building and then go back to Kansas. <laughs> nice. Now. Now, tell, let me tell you, I start with 12 in Kansas. Yeah. Down I go four. to four in LA. I sell two years later, I sold the four in LA. What did I go back and get in Kansas? 180. <laughs> <laughs> At an 11 cap. 
<laughs> How much did you hit a hundred units? No, I got 54 units. Wow. That's really excellent. Okay. So 54. Um, yeah. That's bananas. I mean, bananas. Na- bananas, like close yeah. to an eight cap. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and um, so I I four and a half times I started with 12, right? Right. And I four and a half to 54 in two years. At that right? point, you're thinking, what the hell am I doing in the entertainment industry? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I really wasn't, I was so in it at that point. Cause I started, I had started, um, at that point soon, almost immediately afterwards, I started working on actually probably what I'm best known for. Like if you, if you actually Google me, this is what will come up. It's my, the, the movie that I ended up making. So I, I started, I did my, this was my first syndication <clears throat> is, um, I, I had this idea for a film in a sense, inspired by what happened to my parents, why they left Taiwan in the first mm-hmm. place. So in the late 70s and early 80s, there were a series of murders of Taiwanese professors in the United States. Huh. And it turns out these professors were being spied upon by their students, and those students were being hired by the government of Taiwan. Wow. Huh. So I wrote a story about an FBI agent investigating the murder of a professor, You know, finds out all this stuff, chases the killers to Taiwan, finds out that the killers are actually Chinese mobsters hired by the government to kill political dissidents in the U S the U S knows about it and doesn't want to do anything because of the U S Taiwan, China relationship. Right. And, um, and so it all has to do with like the politics of the U S Taiwan and China. And, um, and so I went about raising money primarily at first in the Taiwanese community. Um, and then, and then eventually once I raised, the first 5 million, <laughs> then, then I started going to the broader community. So wow. how um, big was the budget for so the film? Seven and a half million. That's amazing. Did yeah. you have any stars in it? So um, aside from you, of course. <laughs> so do you know, um, do, do you know J- who James Vanderbeek is? Yeah, of course. Yeah. So yeah. James Vanderbeek, Dawson's Creek. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. So yeah, you guys know, um, uh, James Vanderbeek from yeah. Dawson's Creek. I did a commercial uh, with him actually. So that's oh, you did? You did a yeah. commercial with James? Okay, I did. good. He's awesome. Okay, so you know, so you know. Uh oh! I told you it was the Vanderbeek <laughs> cursed. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Whenever you're ready. Uh, John Hurd plays his partner. Um, we have a lot of like character actors you definitely recognize, like Wendy Crewson and you know, just a bunch of a bunch of, you know, like, you know, <laughs> interestingly enough, my d- the director, Adam Kane, um, had worked on the uh, show 24 with Kiefer mm-hmm. Sutherland. Mm-hmm. Actually, his wife, uh, um, his wife at that time, Leslie Hope, who's also in the movie, Fantastic. played his wife in the first season of 24. Oh, and it turned out a lot of my actors had actually worked on that show oh that's great another so that's makes sense because it was a political thriller so i gotta say that like i mean obviously you you went out and got taiwanese money i guess it sounds like a a big portion of it primarily yes that's a really really big budget like now you wouldn't be able to get seven million you wouldn't need seven million dollars for for a movie but like to raise that much money like you would need I'm trying to think of the stars that you would have to, you would have to. Yeah, get I did it. And I did it without any stars. I did it without script. <laughs> like, really? I mean, I no, no, I, I, you know, I showed people a sizzle reel I had cut, you know, and I, I was just continuing to build it, but it was a story. Like, you know, there were people in the community who really wanted the story told. Yeah. Um, and, and, you know, this is where the political side came like helpful because I had watched a lot of people, do campaigns and I knew kind of how campaigns were run and mm-hmm. how they raise money for campaigns. Mm-hmm. And so like I, I ran, I basically ran a political campaign. Like That's I, so great. I, I was like t- flying to fundraisers all over the country. People would organize those fundraisers for me. I would basically show up and then the money would start coming in. So you had you a know? roadshow crew. I had a roadshow. Day. Like I was like, yeah, I, I did hundreds of fundraisers i always like wow. you know being out of hollywood and zach i think i told you this but i always felt if like syndicating real estate once i kind of learned how to raise capital and, and do that stuff 
it's the same exact thing for movies. And I spent years trying to raise capital for films, which in, you know, for a nobody who didn't have a story like you, even getting your first hundred grand to just do a little oh, even crappy getting your indie first movie. Five grand right. is hard. I mean, right. I remember, I remember my very first fundraiser, like um, a friend of mine, my best friend, he's a doctor in Honolulu, Taiwanese American like myself. Mm -hmm. And he knew I'd been like, had this movie idea in my mind. He's like, hey, I have a talk with the Taiwanese Medical Association in Honolulu. You should come and pitch your movie. <laughs> I was like, wow, okay. So I put together an LLC. I put together a PP, a private placement memorandum. Yeah. You know, right. I, I put together like a brochure. I just remember going out there. I put together this really nice, beautiful brochure, like, you know, little booklet with like the story and all this stuff. And um, I went to Kinko's to get it copied. And they're like, yeah, that's like $3 a page. And it'll, it'll cost <laughs> you like $100 to copy this. And I'm like, wait, how much? <laughs> <laughs> wow. And so I found a print shop in Chinatown that did it for like, you know, a quarter of the price. But I was still like out of pocket, like hundreds and hundreds yeah. of dollars. Crazy. And um, and I'm calculating the cost of my trip. And I'm just like, I'm like I said, I'm a poor actor. I don't have a ton of money. And um, and my friend, you know, gets up there and does his talk on back pain or whatever the, the doctors talk about. Mm -hmm. and, uh, right. Then he's like, hey, my friend Will Tiao, he's an actor, filmmaker. He's here from Hollywood. He has this idea. You guys should listen to it. So I'm like, <laughs> okay. Wow. You know what's really, so, really interesting? It, it's, it's the same structural concept of raising money for a real estate syndication, right? You're putting a private placement memorandum together, you're forming an LLC, but in real estate, it's it, the investor is very focused on what are the returns, right? What are you investing in? What are the returns? I just yeah. had that but thought. Yeah. Raising money for your movie, it's gotta be so much more emotional. Yeah, and so so I did have primary. a structure for returns. Like I had, I had, shares right i had a shares b shares c shares right the b shares were for development and they got a preferred return i remember they got a hundred percent preferred return i remember and then the c shares which were the production shares got a 25 percent preferred return wow. right wow. and then if once all that was paid back then yeah. we would split 50 50 with the a shares which were the producer shares right and um and so the 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 structure was done in such a way that made it seem like, okay, if the movie makes money, like everybody's going to, you know, Do participate well. yeah. type of thing, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so, uh, but I definitely, you know, as I started raising money more and more, I think for a lot of people, it was like, so the B shares I remember were 5,000 each. Right. And I, I walked out of that room that, that first with 10 K and 10 K two wow. two B shares. Nice. Wow. It took me nine months to raise all the B shares, there were 50 B shares, a quarter million dollars. Okay. And those people were not guaranteed a movie, right? right? They were just right. like, that's just development. You're doing the okay. Kickstarter. You're doing the Kickstarter plan, right? You this get a t-shirt. Pre-Kickstarter. Pre this is you get a Kickstarter. You give me $5,000 right. $5, and you get a t-shirt and a, and a uh, you know. I didn't even we'll, give them a t-shirt. I didn't give them any, I didn't give them anything, but like, <laughs> this is all pre-Kickstarter, pre-Indiegogo, pre-any yeah. of those, yeah. right? I'm just doing this like on my own, you know, and then 5,000 increments. That's a ton of investors. It's a ton of investors. That's just the B shares. Then I get to the C shares, which were 25 K each. Okay. I had 222 investors in this syndication. Oh my God, dude. You're like the producers. <laughs> oh my God. And so, okay. So let's unpack and, and it. You know, everything I do even now, now that I'm in development, like now I'm starting to do ground yeah. up construction. It's like everything, I, I put it all in those terms still, like how I built that movie. Mm -hmm. You know, everything is about like, like, yeah, what's my development costs? What's my, you know, what's my production costs? What's all these things? And, mm -hmm. and even to this day, like I still think of architects as like, okay, they're like the production, like this is the production designer and this is the director. <laughs> like, yeah. I, I'm yeah. still the producer. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Well, what's also, I mean, just kind of stepping to the side of a little bit, look at it, what I love, and it, this sounds like it's a really, it's a running theme, you know, with you, it sounds like it is, you know, you, I don't know how cautious you are, but I do know that 
it seems like you, once you decide to go, you go and, and you're open to whatever new information there is and you're able to adapt very quickly and do it. Jump on a plane to Hawaii, stop by a Kinko's before you go to a meeting and, you know, and do all this. And Hey, the worst that can happen is people say no. And that, you, you know, have, I mean, exactly. I don't know if you said that, but that's, that's amazing. That's precisely, that's why I was talking about a little bit earlier about like back on the East coast. Like I, I heard, Oh, don't do that. That's like out mm-hmm. of your lane. That's like, whatever, like here people are like really open to like, yeah, just go for it. exactly. The worst they can say is no, right. you know, right. Like, okay. So jumping a little bit into the real estate side. Right. So I bought that fourplex in Los Feliz that I was mentioning. They were, um, they were two bedroom, two and a half baths. Average rent, like it was between 15 and 1800. Hmm. Okay. This is in 2003. I took one look at these and I'm like, in New York, these would be 6K. You know, I, I was coming from New York, right? Hmm. And I was like, two bedroom, two and a half bath, tall ceilings, two floors, two parking spaces in a good neighborhood. What's good? This is, you're this the one who's K. You, you're you the know? one that started the, <laughs> the rent growth in LA. You're the, the, <laughs> so it was not a rent control building. Oh man. So I immediately, I, I read, I, so I said, okay, well, we're raising rents to 2000. Everybody gave me the finger <laughs> and was like, fuck you. <laughs> I'm leaving. <laughs> you got your first F word on this podcast. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Okay. And all of a sudden I found myself with an empty building. I'm like, oh shit, I need, I need to get some tenants. Did it completely empty out? Like nobody well, bought in? Well, not or? immediately, but it, it started to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was like, I got to get some tenants in here. So my thought was, so what I did was I put an ad in Craigslist, New York. Like most people were getting apartments on Craigslist. So I was like, I'm going to put it on Craigslist, New York. And I said, hey, thinking about a move to LA, come, yeah. you know, here's yeah. a two bedroom, two bath townhouse, blah, blah, blah. You know, walk, and I, I emphasize the walking part because it was Los Feliz Village. So I'm like, mm-hmm. you can walk to every cafe, restaurant, blah, blah, you know, very New Yorker. There's even a subway here. There was a subway at Sunset in Vermont. And for those who you know, don't right. don't know Los Angeles, like Los Feliz is the area where New Yorkers pretty much want to live if they're not well, living in the West Side. Well, that started a little bit with us because I put that ad out. All of a sudden, all my tenants, I had... Uh, unit one was bed Brooklyn. Number Unit two was Central Park West. <laughs> That's awesome. Unit three was Long Island. They all <laughs> couldn't fantastic. stand each other. But oh they God. all, like, they broke that 2000 barrier like that. That's fantastic. That's great. Great strategy. Yeah, I love that story, man. <laughs> I really do. And I love that you got into, you know, one of the biggest things that just really turns me off about LA and California, and I'm very vocal about it, is just just you know rent control like like i don't know how you guys do it you being you know buying and selling transacting and zach you know actually being a landlord i just don't know how you guys do it i know you have to right you got to put money somewhere but like dude it's a whole thing it's a whole thing you know um i mean that's a whole nother podcast to just talk about rent control and what that means you know um you know, it's it's bit it's pretty devastating, and I think you you see the effects. You know, like the fact. I mean, I think you can trace very well a lot of our lack of housing, especially in the multifamily world, is specifically because of rent control. Interesting. Right? So there have been because countless it, studies that rent control doesn't work. You know, it well, it does the, the opposite it, of what you want it to do. It does the opposite. That's right. It does. Yeah. <laughs> it increases rents. Right. Because it increases rent. It, it keeps like dilapidated housing out there. And exactly. It, because it encourages people to stay, you know, in their units. So they, there's no turnover. Right. Encourages them to stay. It discourages owners from investing in their buildings because they can't raise the rent anyways. Yeah. Right. That's right. And well, so you, you create this dilapidated housing stock. What and makes then, it even worse too is the tenants actually put their own money in. So now you have all these units, one with the, you know, an in-wall air conditioner and one with a freaking, you know, a ductless. And then one, you know, one guy has a tankless water heater and like all kinds of just weird things that aren't, you know, they're they're not uniform either. 
You know, I had a friend, he'd been in his place for 30 years. He came out here when he was like 19 in the early 90s as an actor is paying 500 bucks a month. He's right. like, I am never leaving. I'll, I'm never leaving. leaving. That's because of rent control, right? Rent control. If it wasn't for rent control, you know, like, but he's there. He's going to stay there. The place is going to continue to fall apart, right? So the very first real estate syndication deal I did, um, so I, you know, after the movie came out, the crash happened, you know, I, I started, you know, looking back into real estate. My wife, well, I, I got married at that time and my wife and I decided to both get our licenses. We just bought a house. And um, so one of the first real estate, like, and, we, and then we started transacting immediately in multifamily and doing property management because that was just my background. And, um, and so we just started picking up deals you know, mostly in the area we were in, we were in Echo Park, Silver Lake, Los Feliz, those kind of areas, you know, and this was 2012 through 2019, you know, it, those were really, really strong years. Yeah. Um, the first deal I did as a developer, as a syndicator um, was, so there was, I had just sold a five unit on Echo Park Avenue near near the lake just on the other side of sunset and um i'd done quite well on that deal for for my client i, I was the broker mm -hmm. right mm -hmm. and somebody told me about an off-market five unit just like literally like three houses down no, three three properties down and it was such a classic example of what we're talking about so five units front was a fourplex there was a, a guest house in the back you know, the place is falling apart. The family, yeah. Chinese family owned it for 40 years, probably never touched it since then. You know, when we did the inspection, my wife was pregnant at the time and literally the inspector told her to leave <laughs> Oh wow! <laughs> because there was so much hoarding, you know, there's like papers everywhere and there's like 10 sock, you know, 10 plugs in a single socket. Wow. Right. Right. Scary. So, I mean, it was just like scary. It's scary, yeah. you know? And so, and when we bought it, we were told they're all two bedroom, one bath uh, in the fourplex and then a one bedroom, one bath uh, in the back. I, I didn't, have, you know, we had enough money to buy, but I didn't have either the money or the know-how at that time, how to kind of do all the work that needed to be done. So I brought on partners. Um, we bought it. We ended up negotiating all the tenants, relocating. Um, and then one of the partners is a contractor. So he, re he, he did the build of the wait, 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 wait. That just sounded way too. You didn't have that sounded way too easy. Like maybe now tenants are like totally hip, but this all yeah, we just negotiated, we got them out, cash for keys, it was all cool. Like it, now people are struggling. Now with that, that right? would be much harder, but this was right. 2016. Okay. So it was it was six years ago, six, seven years yeah. ago, right? Tenants were in his hip, I guess. Yeah, and and also like. I mean, this place really needed the world. <laughs> it was it was in pretty bad shape, you know. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, we actually, yeah, we brought on somebody to do the negotiation, and you know, and she was that Shelby, you know, we 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 we, we worked with her, you know, since. And um, yeah, but it it just came, and then obviously I have the experience because we we managed so many units in the area. Mm -hmm. I, I I do remember one time after the tents had cleared all their stuff, my partners call me, they're like, hey, Will, you need to come over. I'm like, what's going on? So I go upstairs, I go up to one of the units upstairs. And so one room that we thought was a closet <laughs> because there was so much stuff in there, after we opened it up, we realized, oh, this could be, I looked at it, I'm like, this could be a bedroom. They're like, exactly. Wow. So we, we, we got three bedrooms. Fantastic. Instead of two, wow. all That's of a sudden key. our numbers start to like, that's the key, you know, like change, yeah. Yeah, yeah. you know? So just to give you a sense, the three bedroom, one baths upstairs were 750 square feet. So you can imagine Those the size of these bedrooms. Those yeah. are tiny. That's perfect for your New Yorkers, right? 6,000. Right. <laughs> so I got, what did I get? 750 square feet for one unit, not not the bedrooms, but like the entire unit is 750 square feet. So each ah. bedroom is what, like 100, 150? It's crazy. If, right? Crazy. Um, I got 3,300 for that unit. I got 3K for the two bedrooms. 
and I got 25 K 2,500 for the one bedroom. In the That's pack. bananas. And we sold it for three times purchase. That's you know, right. It was, it was like a home run, you know, yeah. and that taught me, I'm like, okay, this, that's how, I mean, that's how people, you know, that's the only way it works, you know, yeah, from yeah. a, from a number standpoint. Right? right. Well, let's talk about the ticks because I know you're yeah. working with clients about ticks, which is another way to get around this whole. Exactly. So restriction. the partner that I met on that first echo park deal. So then he brought me on a deal. He had gotten a, a property under contract. It was an eight unit, very similar to my first deal. It was like eight units. They were all townhomes in West Hollywood. And it was like, it's a beautiful, like older French Normandy building that hadn't obviously not been upkept because of rent control, but it had potential. And so my, my partner, like that's what he does. He, he went in and negotiated the, he did the LS act and he did the cash flow. He's the general partner. Mm -hmm. I, I basically helped him raise the money and then I brokered the deal. So LS Act for our listeners who aren't aware yes. is you can negotiate and basically force your tenants to leave in exchange for a certain amount of cash. Because you are taking those time. units off the rental market. Right. So you're you never saying, going to I am not going to, yeah, you're not going to, you're not going to rent, not never, but there's very strong restrictions in terms of how you can rent them, if you can rent them, you know. And so um, your plan is to convert that property to basically what's called tenants in common, where you're going to sell the individual apartment units to new home buyers that want to it, buy. It's, it's like a condo, but it's called it's, like a, it's more like a co-op, right? Right. It's more like a co-op where you're owning a piece of the building, a percentage of the building. Mm -hmm. Now in a co-op, like in New York, like you're actually buying shares in a cooperation, right? And then with the right to a particular unit. But the problem with co-ops like the very famous example is Madonna co-op, the Madonna co-op, co right? Yeah. Where like the co-op refused to allow Madonna to buy in because <laughs> they didn't want Madonna in their co-ops. <laughs> okay. <laughs> a TIC is different in that it, as long as you structure it correctly in the way we structured ours was like no other TIC owner could say who one could sell or buy to, buy right. from. Right. And so right. you just own a percentage of the building with the right to your unit. Right. Because if the three of us buy, let's say a triplex together, you, you know, Mark, Zach, Will buy a triplex together, unless we have an agreement beforehand, technically each of us has the right to go to, into anybody's yeah, unit. Yeah, there's an undivided, time. undivided interest. It's an undivided yeah. interest as an yeah. as a tick. However, if we come to an agreement beforehand and we're like, okay, Mark gets unit A, Zach gets unit B, Will gets unit C, and they get the exclusive right. To those mm -hmm. units and that exclusive right includes the right to be able to sell it you know yeah. sell your interest then you've structured it correctly so you, that's really key is to yeah. get the right kind of structure yeah. and, and just as a side note because this is a, a this is the only time that i've ever kind of seen this in in talking to people it's been on the west coast it kind of started out in the bay area it kind of came down here to la and it's it's really an alternative to condos where where condos, unfortunately, um, when you're buying condos, you know, you're really under the restrictions of, of FHA and, and, and um, basically if it gets certified uh, through, through FHA, I think it's FHA, not Fannie Mae, FHA. And if there's too many renters in the building and, or, or if the HOA doesn't have enough reserves or whatever, you can't get a loan for, for your condo. It's very difficult. And so these ticks were ways to kind of avoid that, um, avoid some of those issues because you have a whole, you basically have a little, I mean, it's not a condo, it's a house or a, uh, yeah, it's like full ownership, you know, and you have, you have own... equity in a building, right. Right? right? And and the thing is, there are risks involved, like at least with a condo, with a condo map, you own your individual unit technically. Like, you know, that's been mm -hmm. parceled out. You have your own APN, you pay your own property tax. In a tick, once again, like going back to the example, like if the three of us owned it together, we would have one property tax bill, mm -hmm. you know? And, um, and so we'd be jointly responsible for that property mm -hmm. tax bill. Mm -hmm. So there are some risks to that, obviously, 
you know, and there's going to be shared expenses and whatnot. And so because of that, usually the, the lenders, there aren't as many lenders that do tick loans right. and the lending tends to be a little bit more expensive. So therefore normally ticks are usually priced about 10 to 15% lower than a condo. Mm-hmm. So that's what catches people's eyes. It's like, Oh, I can buy a two bedroom in West Hollywood, you know, two bedroom townhouse for 700 K like that's, you know, that's impossible right. even to buy a right. condo for that number, you know? Right. So, um, so a lot of people like it for that reason, you know, is that it's, it's a great entry point for first time home buyers, you know, in a very right. unaffordable market generally. Right, 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 right. Now right. for the investor who's looking for a way to make money in a rent controlled environment, yeah, it's a way to potentially figure out how to buy that's your value add proposition. That's you're going to buy a rent controlled apartment building that's got really below market rents, but you're going to Ellis Act these tenants, give them cash for keys. Eventually they'll move out and you go through the tick process of converting it to a tenants in common, upgrade Correct. the individual units and sell them off. Correct. That's what exactly yeah. what we did with that eight unit in West Hollywood. Yeah. And yeah. what's the current status? Are you st- is there still a moratorium? on Ellis acting tenants in Los Angeles? So there is in Los, there's a, there is a moratorium in terms of being able to move a tenant out due to the Ellis Act, um, which it, which coincides with the rent uh, eviction moratorium, which right as So that right was now, all COVID, that's all COVID related. It's all COVID related. Gotcha. And right now- and they just extended to, it this week for another month. Where, did they? Uh, I, I didn't hear. Yeah. I, yeah. I had heard, last I had heard it was June, 30th, 2023. So I know there was a, actually, actually yesterday at city hall, there was a, um, there was a protest against. Right. The- exactly. Yeah. I got, I'm a member of the apartment association. And yeah. That's how I, they, they, they sent us an update. Huge what? protest. What does a know, landlord to- protest look like? I want to know what that a lot of people there. I mean, they had to lock it down. And of course, all of the council members, except one voted to extend the eviction moratorium and the rent increase freeze. Yeah, that's crazy. I know. I know. It's really sad. You know, I mean, we as a management company, we pretty much only deal with mom and pop landlords. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, you know, there is this, um, there is this kind of story in the media that's like all these corporations are buying, you know, all these things, but like, actually it's mostly mom and pop landlords, a it lot is. of them. And, and it is really the ladder up for most people to like, you know, for middle-class people to attain wealth in this country, Absolutely. you know, yeah. is like buying some of these smaller buildings. It's, it's yeah. a, a chance for that. It's for a lot of my clients, it's their retirement, yeah. Yeah. you know? And, and it's a lot more democratic, frankly, than stocks, right? Stocks are, most stocks are owned by a very small percentage of people. But like, if you look at the, I, I recently read a study where like, you know, if you look at the numbers, like the people who own real estate, it's a lot of middle-class people who Absolutely. want to own real estate. Yeah, yeah. especially smaller, no? especially smaller multifamily type of stuff. Exactly. Sure. And, and Which is LA's mostly what you have stuff. in Los Angeles. That's correct. So it's buildings. it's a huge opportunity for middle class people to be able to, you know, have some type of, you know, hedge mm-hmm. as, you know, just a, a, a larger investment, you know, some type of investment that they can use, you know, and often it's, it's obviously passed down to their kids and whatnot. Right. And it's really unfortunate that, you know, it's not, re- it, you know, people like just assume it's all these like big corporate landlords, yeah. greedy, blah, 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 blah. I'm like, no, right. like, I mean, if one of those tenants pays rent, they have a triplex and it's a mom and pop, they can't afford their mortgage. They yeah. can't afford the expenses. You know, it's really, it's really sad. Yeah. yeah. Are you seeing a lot of your clients in duress because they can't evict non-paying tenants for going well, on two and a half years now? So I think... For us, we haven't seen that as much. We've been very proactive in dealing with our tenants and giving them information on where they can get, you know, funds from the government, you know, like, and working with them. And I had one, just one tenant out of over 200 units, right? Um, I had one tenant 
who didn't hadn't paid since March 2020, um, owed almost 100k. Oh um, but the government paid it all. I just got the check last week. Finally cleared his cleared his ledger. Oh, that's you know? great. I mean, I I still feel for my landlords, my clients. It took them two and a half years to be they, made is, is the tenant still in the property? Too? Still in the property. So you, and, you, and as soon as the statewide eviction moratorium like like lifted, of course he started paying. You know, like it, it's like you know, it's one thing if if it's real, like you know, like people are, some people are in serious financial trouble. Mm -hmm. But frankly, most of those people were smart enough, frankly, to leave. Like they were like, well, I just can't afford this. I'm still going to owe that money, so I just can't afford it. I'm going to go. You know, like those those people really thought. But it's the people who really took advantage of the situation, those are the people who stayed. You know, that's yeah, what I, we've seen. I I say I, when it when it was happening, you know, we were dealing with a property that was a little kind of like that. It wasn't in California, but you know, I was I always say go out and check the the trash bins. If you see a bunch of TV boxes and like you know electronics PS4 boxes, you know what's happening with you know the money that should be going to the rent. Basically, nothing you can do about yeah. it during that. I time, mean, but. we had a couple tenants in, at one of our apartments where the manager would tell us they walked into their unit and yeah, they had a you know new TV or you know a new car, but um, they were claiming COVID and um, seeking rental assistance. So, so I, I got it. Just to kind of um, you know. I, I, we're probably going to have to wrap this up. I know we had a sure. couple glitches, but and this is very broad, um, but it's very interesting. And, and you have become successful in so many different areas. It's almost like, you know, you're charmed for sure. Absolutely. You got to know that. But how would you, a, a couple of things, you know, most of us, I fell into real estate because I, because it was very helpful for me to, to, to be doing what I was doing, you know, film and TV wise and being an actor and all that. And I didn't have to go into the, into the, into waitering, you know, becoming a, 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 a waiter or a bartender or whatever. And so just talk to me a little bit about how real estate really kind of changed your life and all of that and kind of help make things maybe more secure for you. Yeah, or, for sure. And when, was there a point that you had to transition to real it seems like, you know, you, you're an investor first, so maybe you didn't have this yeah. issue, but for real tours, they have a period when it's, they burn through their friends and family network, you know, the Keller Williams thing, right? They burn yeah. through their friends and family and they have to find a way to start marketing yeah. and succeed wider. If they don't right. do that, they crash and burn. Sure. You know? Sure. So, absolutely. Um, I know there's two questions in there, but maybe just start with, you know, how it's kind of change your life and help you and, and all of that stuff. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I've been doing this now for a little over 10 years. Um, it's like we talked about, it's like my third career. And and obviously, like I mentioned, I had a background in it, right? Like I, I did kind of grow up in this world. So I knew about it. I, I had even, when I first came and was an actor, I even looked at the real estate books, but I just wasn't, I was, I was so focused on being an actor at the time. I wasn't really thinking about it, but you know, obviously, it's always been kind of in the background for me. <laughs> I, I just had a, I just had a thought. I remember when I was like 12 years old, I was in Hong Kong on a trip with my parents, and I got one of those fortunes, and it said, "You will be, you will be very good or very strong in real estate, and not very good in <laughs> stocks." <laughs> It said that, <laughs> and it literally like just stuck in my head. So I've really Landed never played. Right I've really never wow. played the stock market. I've never played the stock market, um, even though you know who knows. Um, but um, but my real estate side has always been been pretty strong. And you know, being in Los Angeles, it's it, it is the one thing. It's like you know, it, it, ever it just grows. You know, mm -hmm. it, it, with the rare exception of two thousand eight right? And 91, right? Those are the only two times that real estate has ever gone down in this market. Right. right. And um, that's a really good point. You know, I mean, it's just, it's, it's, it's one of the safest investments there is, you know, frankly. Um, and, um, and so it's, it's been, you know, it's been a very good experience for me and it's allowed me obviously to continue to do other, other pursuits and other creative things. So mm -hmm. that's, that's been really nice. 
Um, your second question was, um, oh yeah, after, you know, how do you expand your network? Well, you know, not unsimilar, it's true. We started with friends and family. My, my, um, my wife's aunt who was in Taiwan was our first client. She was an investor. We helped her buy initially about 20 units mm -hmm. and then manage all those. And then, but she was like, like a lot of Asian investors, they buy cash. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And I had to kind of explain to them, I'm like, you know, you can leverage, right? <laughs> and, and like, it's a very, like, it's still very foreign for Asian investors, particularly who are used to paying in cash. Yeah. I'm like, let me show you. And I literally <laughs> took those 20 units and I got her 40 units. Wow. And she was like, oh, wait, I didn't have to spend any more. I'm like, no, you don't have to spend any more money. <laughs> That's, great. That's great. That's funny. So, um, and then, you know, through the success of that, and then we started picking up, you know, more clients. And, and the thing is now, I think, you know, we are one of the few places that you can go because most people are either just brokers, realtors, right. or they're property managers. Yep. Very few people do both. That sounds like it's a key for you. That sounds like it was it's, a key it's, for it's, you. It's really our competitive advantage yeah. because, and it's totally understandable because they are different businesses, yeah. you know, and most commercial, well, realtors, period, once they're done with the sale, they're, they're like, bye, we, we have yeah. no interest, you know, they yeah. take their commission and they're gone, you yeah. know? management it's it's a tough it's a tough hoe you know it's plus like, you it sounds like you leaned into you leaned into the asian community and i would imagine that that is such a deep value add to handhold the management portion for them that that probably helped you along too so definitely the vast majority of our owners you know it's interesting you know we are probably one of the highest rated like property management companies in the city on Yelp and on Google and stuff. And a lot of that, and, and so a lot of people who find us, interestingly enough, they are Asian American. They're often second generation where, where it's a, a parent's, you know, you know, mm -hmm. asset and they're, they're, they're either inheriting it and, or, you know, they're being handed off and that's happening more and more. It's not just Asian American. I have a Ukrainian, I have Mexican, like, you know, whatever, like, it's like, it's, it's a lot of people, there's a generational shift happening. I think we all know this, you know, mm -hmm. maybe boomer generation is retiring. They've been managing these assets themselves and now they're handing off their kids mm -hmm. and their kids are, you know, looking at these assets. Like, I don't want to handle this, <laughs> you know, or, or, or they're like, but dad, you've been charging so little for rent for so long. Like, you know, we could do so much more, right. you know? And so they're looking how, how do we maximize that? So that's, that's what we do. We look, we help them evaluate their asset. We're like, okay, this is what you could do, mm -hmm. you know, and this mm -hmm. is what it would cost to get mm -hmm. to that point. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, we just, get, we are very clear eyed about it. So we're like, we give them options. You can sell it, you can value add it, you can hold it and continue doing what you're doing, right. you know? And so, um, um, and then, like I said, and then just the management piece, having, you know, someone handle that for people, you know, I mean, that's where we get most of our calls. It's like people just wanting management. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's great. It's awesome. Well, this has been awesome. Well, yeah, we man, this has been fantastic. On. We need Thank another, so we need another hour and a half, maybe more. <laughs> <laughs> sure. It was great. Sorry about all the glitches. Oh, no sweat. No sweat. <laughs> Take care of it. Yeah. So, um, hey, if anybody wants to get in touch with you, um, you know, especially if they're out here in, in Los Angeles and, um, or if they want to, you know, see your movie or check you out, like what, so how, how can they number one, find out what's going on with you on the acting and the entertainment side, but also get in touch with you, uh, with the real estate stuff. So, um, probably best to follow our social media, you know, um, we're at Tiao properties That's T I A O properties, um, on Instagram. We're, we also have a Twitter presence, uh, a Facebook presence. I have my own you know, kind of Facebook pages, you know, for my, more of my creative entertainment stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, that's just under my, my personal name at Will Tiao. Um, and, um, but, and we're pretty active on there. You know, we're pretty active on the socials. Um, I haven't 
quite yet mastered TikTok. We're still working on that. <laughs> I don't, my dancing skills are not that strong. So <laughs> um, and uh, I don't even know if real estate investors are really on TikTok. I mean, they, they are. are on Instagram because people do find us on Instagram, which is yeah, they are. Um, but, Your Instagram um, feed is good, by the way. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, we try. We try. And we do reels and stuff. And some of those reels have taken off, you know, especially when we're talking about like, what's going on in the market or, mm -hmm. you know, we do a lot of education. I have, we have a meetup that meets once a month. It's a Los Angeles multifamily uh, investor networking group. Nice. And uh, I have almost 2000 people in that, in that meetup. Great. And um, we, we, we have different speakers every month. So uh, love to have you guys on, you That'd know, awesome to talk, yeah. you know? So, yeah. So you, we're always trying to stay engaged with the community and, keep ourselves out there. We, we, we enjoy the education piece of it. Um, it, it, it helps both sides. It's keeps us current and, um, it, it, it has, you know, people coming to us for, for advice and, you know, we get to trade information. So cool. Fantastic. Excellent. Well, thank you right. so much again. And, um, yeah, let's definitely, now that we're kind of all getting back into things, let's definitely, I'd love to come to your meetup for sure. And, yeah. You know, Zach and I've talked a little bit about restarting ours as well and, and, you know, getting back into it. We'd love to have you back and, and, you know, do some sort of presentation. I think you did one for us once. So we'd love to I have I think you back. so maybe. Yeah. Before. Yeah. 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 Pre COVID. Yeah. The before times. <laughs> the before times. <laughs> All right. Thank All right. you so hey, Thanks, much. Will. Thanks very much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Zach. I really appreciate it. 10X for Gen XYZ is hosted by Zach Winner and Mark Adair Reels, co-founders of Prosperity CRE, a commercial real estate investment firm committed to providing its investors with ongoing cash flow and building long-term wealth. If you like the podcast, please give us a positive rating and subscribe to be notified about future content. Also, if you'd like to learn more about our approach to real estate investing, you can download a free copy of our real estate investment book, Investing for Cashflow and Long-Term Wealth, by clicking the link in the show notes below. Thank you and stay tuned for our upcoming episodes.